God, the creator and giver of life. Does he speak? Does he care about us? Can we know him? Yes. He spoke, he cares, and his message for all people tells us how to know him. 3,500 years ago, God began instructing men to write down his words. Over the next 1,500 years, God continued to speak, and 40 different men recorded these messages from him. The early writings were called the Law and the Prophets. These, and the rest of God's words recorded on scrolls, became known as the Scriptures. Today, these same writings, bound together in one book, are called the Bible. These holy words tell about God and how much He loves all people in the world. This is God's story. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth had no form. It was empty, covered with darkness and water. Then the Spirit of God hovered over the water. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. Then he divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a great expanse of air to divide the waters below from the waters above. And God called the expanse heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the water under the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear, and it happened. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth produce grass and herbs and fruit trees, all yielding after their own kind. And it happened. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the heavens. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. God made two great lights, the sun to rule by day and the moon to rule by night. He also made the stars, and he set them all in the heavens to give light upon the earth. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters abound with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth. So God created great whales and everything that moves in the water and winged animals, all these producing after their species. And God saw that it was good. And he blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth be filled with living creatures. So he made the animals on the earth, the cattle and everything that crawls upon the earth, all producing after their species. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So God created man in his own image, and he created them, male and female. God named the first man Adam, then later Adam called a woman Eve. And God said, A man shall leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. The heavens and the earth were finished. So on the seventh day God ended his work. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. The Lord God also planted a garden in Eden, and out of the ground he made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. In the middle of the garden stood two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord put man in the garden of Eden to care for everything in it. Then the Lord God commanded, you may eat freely from every tree of the garden, 
except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You must never eat from that tree. In the day that you do, you will surely die. God showed his love for Adam and Eve by giving them all they needed and more to enjoy life to its fullest. He also gave them the ability to make choices. And he gave these ancestors of all humankind an opportunity to use this ability wisely. God wanted Adam and Eve to show their respect by obeying his one command, to not eat from just that one tree. Everything else was theirs to enjoy. To live in peace and happiness in their beautiful garden, Adam and Eve needed only to trust God's wisdom and respect his authority over them. They should have been grateful for life and happy in their freedom. But freedom to choose does not bring happiness when bad choices are made. Long before God created humans, he also gave freedom of choice to the angels he had created. God desired honor from these angels who inhabit the spiritual realm just as he desired honor from people. Most angels did choose to follow God. And even today, these angels worship the Lord and carry out his bidding helping people in many ways. But other angels made a bad choice. They rejected God's love, selecting instead Lucifer, the most beautiful angel, as their leader. Lucifer's arrogance and pride caused him to lose the honored position above God's throne. Lucifer fell from heaven for his rebellion because he had challenged God by saying in his heart, I will elevate my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High God. Lucifer, known also in the scriptures as the devil or Satan, desires worship which belongs only to God. Satan deceives people in order to obtain that worship, even masquerading as a beautiful angel of light. But his lies and his false religions cause pain and suffering and destruction. So God pronounced doom to Lucifer, saying, you will be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. In the beautiful new garden inhabited by Adam and Eve, Satan appeared to Eve in the form of a serpent. Now this serpent was more crafty than any animal which the Lord God had made. And the serpent said unto the woman, Are you sure God said you should not eat from every tree? The woman answered, We may eat fruit from all of the trees in the garden, except for the fruit on one tree in the middle of the garden. About it, God said, You must not eat from that tree. If you do, you will die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. God knows that in the day you eat this fruit, your eyes will be opened, and you will be as God's knowing good. The Bible says Satan is the father of lies, so of course he tried to deceive the woman, and he lied to her about God. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to look at, and that it could make her wise, she took the fruit and ate it, and gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it also. Instantly their eyes were opened and their spirits became dead. They saw that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Then, when they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, Adam and his wife hid themselves from God's presence among the trees of the garden. Because they trusted their own reasoning instead of the words of God, they died spiritually and lost communion with the Lord. Then the Lord God called to Adam, saying, Where are you? Adam answered, I, I heard your voice in the garden, and, and I, I was afraid because I was naked, so, so I hid myself. Then God asked, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the one tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Adam answered, the, the, the woman, the woman that you gave to me, she gave me the fruit, and I ate it. And the Lord said to the woman, What have you done? The woman answered, The serpent deceived me, so I ate the fruit. Then the Lord said to the serpent, 
Because you have done this, you are cursed above every animal. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put hatred between you and the woman, and her descendant will crush your head. This curse against Satan is the first mention in God's book that one day he would send a savior, born of a woman, to defeat Satan. To the woman God said, I will greatly increase your grief. Having children will bring you sorrow, and your husband will rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to your wife, and have eaten from the forbidden tree, the ground is cursed. Now every day of your life, only through difficulty, will you eat from the ground. It will produce thorns and weeds and by the sweat of your brow you will eat bread until you return to the ground. I made you from dust, and you will return to dust. The fig leaves which Adam and Eve sewed together did not cover their nakedness. So the Lord God made clothes from animal skins to cover Adam and his wife. God had to kill an animal to provide covering for them. So through Adam, sin and death, this method of covering people's disobedience by the death of an innocent one was God's plan. Even before he made the world, he knew that people would foolishly reject his leadership and instead try to be the God of their own lives and fail. God calls this rejection sin. Yet because of God's love for everyone, he planned to send a savior who would die to provide the offer of forgiveness for the sins of all people. Then the Lord banished Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, and he placed angels called cherubim at the east of the garden, and a flaming sword which turned every direction, guarding access to the tree of life. From the moment of Adam's sin, all people were destined to die. Yet, in God's story, there is still hope. When Adam's wife Eve conceived, she bore a son. Eve said, I have received a man from the Lord. So she named him Cain. Then she bore another child, a boy called Abel. He chose to be a shepherd, while Cain became a farmer. At a time appointed by God, Cain brought his harvest from the field as an offering unto the Lord. But Abel brought a lamb. The Lord showed respect toward Abel and his offering, but he did not honor Cain and his offering. Cain was furious, so the Lord asked, Cain, why are you so frustrated and angry? God then reminded Cain that the death of an animal was required for sacrifice. Just as fig leaves did not cover Adam and Eve's sin, a gift of bloodless plants and vegetables could never cover sin either. God said that refusal to bring an animal for sacrifice displayed Cain's rebellion because he was not worshiping as God had instructed. The Bible says that Abel's sacrifice showed faith in God's words, but Cain's sacrifice did not. Throughout the scriptures, God reveals that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. But Cain still refused to obey God and bring an animal sacrifice. Instead, he blamed the problem on Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain attacked Abel and killed him. And the Lord asked Cain, Where is your brother, Abel? Cain answered, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? God said, What have you done? I hear the voice of your brother's blood crying to me from the ground. Now you will be cursed on the earth, soaked with your brother's blood, which was drawn by your own hand. When Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, his rebellion against God caused the first murder in the first broken family. As the years passed, Adam and Eve's descendants began to fill the earth. But when God saw that man's wickedness covered the earth, and that every imagination of his heart was only evil continually, it grieved the Lord, and the Lord said, 
I will destroy mankind, which I created from the face of the earth. But the Lord looked on Noah with favor. Noah, a righteous man, perfect in his generations, walked with God. So God said to Noah, The end of all mankind is coming. Because people have filled the earth with violence, I will destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of wood. Build rooms in it and cover it with tar inside and out. Build a boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. But make only one door. You, your wife, your three sons and their wives must go into the ark. Bring also a male and female of every animal into the ark to keep them alive with you. Two of every sort will come to you. But you must take by sevens all the animals which I have declared holy. While building the ark, Noah preached to the wicked people, saying, Those, those who refuse to honor God shall be destroyed. Sadly, everyone mocked Noah and laughed at God's warning. But Noah and his family believed God. So at the appointed time, they entered the ark, and the Lord shut them in. Then God caused it to rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. From underground, water spouted up like fountains, and the waters increased on the earth. The waters kept rising until the ark floated. Finally, the water covered everything on the earth, including the hills and even the mountains. All living creatures died. Birds, cattle, walking and crawling animals, and every person on earth. All were destroyed, drowned in the flood. The waters covered the earth for 150 days. But God took care of Noah and every living thing in the ark. Then God made a wind to pass over the earth, causing the water level to begin to go down. Waters continued to recede from the earth. When the ark came to rest upon the mountains of Ararat, and the plants began once again to grow, God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and every living thing with you. And they went out. Then Noah erected an altar and offered a sacrifice to the Lord. Afterward, God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful, have many children, go out and refill the earth. Also, besides the plants I gave you for food, animals are now delivered into your hand to eat. But anyone who kills another human being must forfeit his own life, because man is made in the image of God. Then God said, Behold, I am establishing my promise with you and with your descendants after you. Never again will all people and animals die from a flood. I am putting my rainbow in the clouds as a token of my promise. Whenever I bring rain clouds over the earth, you will see the rainbow, and I too will see it and honor my covenant. Many generations after Noah, when the whole earth still spoke the same language, People traveled to a plain in the Middle East and settled there. Then they said to one another, let's, let's build a city and a tower. And let's make a name for ourselves so we won't be scattered around the whole earth. This decision was a direct refusal to obey God's command to go out and fill the earth. Also, the tower they planned to build was designed for worshiping the sun, moon, and stars. Mankind had chosen to worship God's creations instead of the Lord himself. The Lord looked upon the city and tower which these people were building, and he said, Behold, the people are organizing as one group, and since they all speak the same language, no thing they imagine to do will be held back from them. Let us go down and confuse their language, so that they cannot understand each other's speech. And the Lord mixed up their language causing them to stop building the city. Therefore the name of that city became Babel, which means confusion, because there the Lord multiplied language on the earth, causing people to scatter abroad. Now about 400 years after the great flood, God appeared to a man named Abram, who lived in the Middle East in a city called Ur. 
God said to him, Leave your country and your relatives and travel to a land that I will show you. There I will make a great nation from you, and I will bless you and make your name great. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And through you shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed and entered into the land of Canaan. And again the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, I give this land to your descendants. Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able. In the same way your descendants shall be countless. Even though Abram and his wife Sarai had no children, Abram believed God, and God counted Abram's faith as righteousness. Then Abram said, Lord God, how can I know that I will inherit this land? And God answered Abram, It will happen like this. Your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and they will be mistreated for 400 years. A nation will use them as slaves, but I will judge that nation. And afterward, your descendants will come out with great wealth, and by the fourth generation, they shall return to this land. But Sarai, Abram's wife, still bore him no children. So Sarai said to Abram, I beg you to go have children by my Egyptian maid, Hagar, and I will just consider her children to be mine. Abram agreed with Sarai's plan. Though he loved the Lord, Abram failed to believe that God would give him a child through his wife. So Hagar bore Abram a son named Ishmael. When Abram was ninety-nine years old, the Lord appeared yet again to him and said, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me. I am giving you the new name of Abraham, which means father of multitudes. And Sarai shall be called Sarah, meaning princess. Now I will bless Sarah and give you a son also from her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Then Abraham pleaded with God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God answered, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have also blessed him, and will greatly multiply his descendants, and I will make him a great nation. God fulfilled his promise to the descendants of Abraham and Ishmael through the Arab nation. God then said, But with Sarah's son, and with his descendants after him, I will establish my covenant which is everlasting. After that, Sarah gave birth to Abraham's son, whom they named Isaac. Now when Isaac was grown, the Lord asked Abraham to demonstrate his faith. God said, Abraham, and he answered, Yes, I am here. And God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon the mountain which I will instruct you to use. Then Abraham got up early in the morning and took Isaac his son as God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham looked and in the distance he saw the appointed place. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and gave it to Isaac to carry. And he took a torch in his hand and a knife and they both went up the hill together. Then Isaac asked Abraham, Father, we have the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both continued up together until they came to the place where God had instructed Abraham to go. There Abraham built an altar and laid the wood in order. Then he tied up Isaac and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand with the knife, preparing to kill his son. Just then the angel of the Lord called out of heaven, saying, Abraham, Abraham. And he answered, Here I am. And the Lord said, Do not lay your hand on Isaac. 
For now I know that you revere me, since you did not withhold your only son. And Abraham lifted up his head and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a bush by his horns. So Abraham took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. The scripture says that Abraham knew that God would fulfill his promises about Isaac, even if God had to raise Isaac from the dead. Then because of Abraham's faith, God said, I will bless you. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and through your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you obeyed my voice. Then Abraham rejoiced as he understood that the Savior, promised long before in the garden, would come from his descendants. God's test of Abraham also illustrated how one day God, the Heavenly Father, would offer his only beloved son as a sacrifice for the whole world. After a time, Isaac married and became the father of twins, Jacob and Esau. Later, God gave Jacob the new name of Israel, and he was chosen to carry on the promised line. Jacob had 12 sons. One of them, Joseph, was sold into slavery by his own brothers. But through God's divine care, he eventually became ruler alongside the king of Egypt, the great Pharaoh. Joseph, being a godly man, forgave his brothers and invited all his relatives to move to Egypt, saving them all from a terrible famine. So the 70 descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, known as the children of Israel, moved to Egypt, the country which would one day enslave them, just as God had foretold Abraham. Now these descendants of Abraham bore many children, and the land of Egypt was filled with them. But a new pharaoh, who did not remember Joseph, began to worry. He told the Egyptians, Behold, the children of Israel, these Hebrews, now outnumber us. We must deal wisely with them. If we let them continue to multiply and we become involved in a war, they might join our enemies and fight against us. So the Egyptians turned the Hebrews into slaves. The brutal slave masters made the lives of the children of Israel bitter with impossibly hard work. But the more they were mistreated, the more they grew in number. Then Pharaoh summoned the Hebrew nurses and told them, When you act as midwives for the Hebrew women, let their daughters live. But all newborn sons you must kill. One Hebrew mother hid her newborn son, but after three months could no longer conceal him. So she laid her baby in a basket covered with tar and placed it in the reeds by the river's bank. When Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe at the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and she looked inside. When she saw the baby and he cried, she felt compassion toward him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. She took the baby and raised him as her son, calling him Moses, which means drawn out of the water. So Moses became destined to inherit the Egyptian kingdom with all of its treasures. After Moses was grown, he went out among his Hebrew relatives who were all in bondage. As he observed their hardships, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. When Moses thought no one was looking, he killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. But Pharaoh heard about the Egyptian's death and went after Moses to kill him. So Moses fled and lived in the land of Midian. After 40 years, that Pharaoh died. The children of Israel groaned under their slavery and their cry rose up unto God. So God set about to honor his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses had become a shepherd. And as he led his flock in the desert, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the middle of a bush. Amazingly, the bush burned, but was not consumed. So Moses said, I must go over there to see this great sight and find out why that bush was not burnt. As he approached, God called to him out of the bush, saying, Moses, Moses. Moses answered, Here I am. Then God said, Come no closer. Take off your shoes, for you're standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. 
And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people in Egypt and have heard their cry. I know their sorrows. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them into a good land flowing with milk and honey. Now Moses, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may lead my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I, who am I that I, sh I should go to Pharaoh and th th that I should bring your people out of Egypt? When I say to the children of Israel, the, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and, and they say back to me, who, 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 What is his name? Who, who, what shall I say to them? Then God said to Moses, I am that I am. You shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And Moses said unto the Lord, Oh my Lord, I, I am not eloquent. I, I, I am not a good speaker. My w w words get tangled up. But the Lord answered, Who has made man's mouth? Haven't I, the Lord? Now go. Aaron, your brother, is a good speaker. Talk through him. I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall say and do. When you return to Egypt, you will do miracles in front of Pharaoh. But I will harden his heart, so that he shall not let the people go. You must tell Pharaoh, the Lord said, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Let my son go, so he may serve me. And if you refuse to let him go, I will kill your son even your firstborn. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and delivered that message. The Lord God of Israel says, Let my people go. But Pharaoh demanded, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So Moses returned to the Lord, asking, Lord, who why did you send me? I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, but, but you have not, not de delivered your people. God answered, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob only by the name God Almighty. Then the Lord explained to Moses that in Egypt he would soon reveal himself as Jehovah, the Savior. And there also he would prove to the Egyptians that all people must worship the one true God, not his creations. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Go before Pharaoh, take your staff, and stretch out your hand on the waters of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded, and struck the river. And all the water in the river turned to blood. The fish died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink any of the water throughout all the land of Egypt. The Lord spoke again to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, The Lord says, Let my people go, so they may serve me. And if you refuse to let them go, indeed I will strike your whole territory with frogs. But Pharaoh refused. So frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. The frogs went into the people's houses and into their bedrooms, on their beds, into their ovens and their mixing bowls. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go, beg the Lord to take away the frogs, and I will let the people go. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief from the plague, he hardened his heart, just as the Lord had said. So God continued to bring plagues upon the land of Egypt. Each time Pharaoh pleaded for the plague to stop, and it would. And then each time he would break his promise to let the children of Israel go. So throughout the land of Egypt, God turned the dust of the earth into lice that crawled on man and on animals. Then the magicians of Egypt said to Pharaoh, this is the work of God. Next God sent swarms of flies upon Pharaoh and upon his servants. He sent a horrible plague that killed the cattle of Egypt. But none of the cattle of the children of Israel died. Then Moses stood before Pharaoh and sprinkled ashes up toward heaven, which caused boils to break out on all the Egyptians and their animals. Next God warned everyone that he would bring a torrential hailstorm on Egypt. All who believed the word of the Lord made their servants and cattle hide inside their houses. 
But those who disregarded the word of the Lord left their servants and their cattle in the field. Then hail, mingled with fire, came down, ruining every planted field, breaking every tree, and killing the servants and animals which were not inside. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel lived, there was no hail. The Lord then brought locusts over all the land of Egypt. They covered everything so that the land was darkened, and they ate every plant which the hail hadn't destroyed. Nothing green remained throughout the land of Egypt. Then the Lord brought darkness. A darkness so thick it could be felt covered all the land of Egypt for three days. People could not see each other, and they did not go outside of their houses. But all of the children of Israel had light in their homes. Pharaoh still wouldn't let all the people go, and even threatened Moses by saying, Get away from me! The day you see my face again, you will die! Moses answered, You have spoken correctly. I will never see your face again. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to bring just one more plague on Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will actually send all of my people out of Egypt. This plague will bring death to all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on a throne, to the firstborn of the maidservant behind the mill. And there shall be a great cry throughout all of the land of Egypt, such as has never happened before and shall never be again. Moses, speak to all the congregation of Israel. Tell them, I said, select a lamb, one for each household. Your lamb must be a year old male with no imperfections. After four days, the whole assembly of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And you must take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the lamb's blood and strike the top of the door frame and the two side posts with the blood. And none of you shall go out the door of your houses until the morning. And you must eat the lamb that night, roasted with fire, but do not break any of its bones. You must eat it with unleavened bread that is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt and will kill all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be a mark of safety on the houses where you are. So when I see the blood, I will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. He will pass over you. And every year after this, you must celebrate the dinner of unleavened bread as a memorial, calling it the Lord's Passover. So the children of Israel did as the Lord had commanded them through Moses and Aaron. Then at midnight it happened. The Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive in the dungeon, even all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh and his servants and all the Egyptians woke up in the night, and there was a great cry in Egypt, but there was not a single house, where there was not one dead. But those inside the houses whose doorposts were marked with the blood of the Lamb were saved. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, You and the children of Israel must get away from my people. Go, serve the Lord just as you want it. And the Egyptians urged the Hebrews to hurry, trying to send them out of the land as quickly as possible, crying out, If you don't leave, we're all going to be dead. The Egyptians even gave their jewels and gold to the departing Hebrews. The children of Israel, numbering now in the millions left, taking with them flocks and herds. Just as God had told Abraham, Abraham's descendants had been slaves. They came out of bondage in the fourth generation with great wealth. So this huge nation, which God called his firstborn, left the land of Egypt and camped on the edge of the wilderness. 
And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Soon Pharaoh will think the children of Israel have been ensnared by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will follow after you. But I will be honored, so that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. Then, just as God had said, Pharaoh and his servants again turned against the Hebrews, saying, Why did we let the slaves of Israel go? And Pharaoh took six hundred chosen chariots, and his horsemen, and his army, and pursued the Hebrews, overtaking them as they encamped with their backs to the Red Sea. When the Hebrews looked up and saw the Egyptians, they were terrified, and they cried out to the Lord. Then Moses said to the people, Do not fear! Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see again no more. The Lord will fight for you. Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift up your staff, and stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall walk on dry ground through the middle of the sea. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused a strong east wind to drive the sea back, and the waters were divided. And Israel went into the middle of the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall beside them on both sides. Then all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen pursued the Hebrews, following them across the dry ground. But the Lord confused the Egyptian army. He caused the wheels of their chariots to fall off so that the horses couldn't pull them. The Egyptians panicked. Let's run from Israel because the Lord fights for them, they said. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea. And when Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, the sea returned to its place. The Egyptians tried to escape from the water, but the Lord defeated them in the middle of the sea. The water covered Pharaoh's army, his chariots, and his horses. All of them were destroyed. But the children of Israel had walked across on dry land, right through the middle of the sea. When Israel saw this great miracle which the Lord did against the Egyptians, the people were awed, and they respected God, and believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. But soon after their rescue from Egypt, the Israelites complained to Moses, saying, you brought us out into the wilderness to die. We have no water, we have no food. Showing great mercy, the Lord said, Watch, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and you shall go out every morning and gather it. He did, and they called it manna. And he also responded to their doubt by bringing them water. Soon this nation camped around a mountain in the desert of Sinai. Suddenly, there was thunder and lightning on the mountain. And out of a thick cloud, the sound of a trumpet blew so loud that all the people trembled. Then the Lord, cloaked in fire, descended on the mountain, and the whole mountain shook. The Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain and spoke these words to him. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And as the Lord spoke, he wrote these ten commandments on tables of stone. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols or bow down to them, nor serve them. You shall not use the name of the Lord your God disrespectfully. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not lie about your neighbor. You shall not lust for your neighbor's house or his wife or anything that is your neighbor's. The Lord gave his perfect standard of holiness through these laws. But then he also showed Moses what people must do when they broke those laws. The Lord said, You must build an altar and dedicate it to me. You shall make sacrifices on it and I will bless you. The blood will be a covering for your sin, and I will forgive you. Finally, after 40 years in the wilderness, the Israelites, known also as Jews, entered the promised land of Canaan. Sadly, the inhabitants of Canaan rejected Jehovah as God and fought against the children of Israel. 
But God protected the Jews as they resettled in the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord ordained priests to oversee the animal sacrifices and to lead in worship. Once a year, the appointed high priest went behind a sacred veil which separated the people from the holy presence of God. There, the priest represented the whole nation before the Lord. After many years, the Israelites crowned a king named David. God chose David, calling him a man after my own heart. And God spoke through David and other godly men called prophets. When the Israelites sinned, the Lord spoke against Israel through these prophets, warning that if the Jews continued to sin, he would allow a foreign nation to overrun their country. In spite of these warnings, Israel was disobedient and rebelled against God, rejecting his laws and killing the prophets who testified against them. Finally, after 800 years of rebellion, Israel was taken out of her own land and made captive in the nations of Assyria and Babylon. But God continued to speak through prophets during the Jews' captivity. Some of the messages were calls to repentance, but others were prophecies about the Savior who would come to rescue sinful mankind. The prophet Micah foretold the exact city where the Savior would be born and described his eternal nature saying, out of Bethlehem shall the one come who will rule in Israel, whose existence is from old, from everlasting. God even revealed that the coming Savior would descend from the royal line of David. Through the writings of the prophet Malachi, the Lord described a special messenger who would announce the coming Savior and prepare the way before him. Zechariah prophesied, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold your king comes to you. He is righteous and has salvation, humble and riding on the fold of a donkey. King David described how the Savior himself would know in advance that one of his close friends with whom he ate bread would betray him. And Zechariah even recorded that the price of the betrayal would be 30 pieces of silver. Through the prophet Isaiah, God foretold that the coming Savior would be tortured by whipping and that his face would be spat upon. David described the method of execution as piercing the Savior's hands and feet, yet not breaking any of his bones. That the Savior would say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that onlookers would laugh and ridicule the Savior, saying, He believed that the Lord would deliver him. David also wrote that the Savior's bones would be out of joint, and in his thirst he would be given vinegar to drink, and that the Savior's persecutors would divide his clothes among them and gamble for his robe. Isaiah said that onlookers would be astonished when they saw how the Savior's face was disfigured from the torture. The prophecies in God's book even describe how one day David's descendants, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, would look at the Savior whom they had pierced. And all of this was written in the scriptures many hundreds of years before the Savior came. After 70 years of captivity, the Lord allowed his people to come back to the land of Israel. Only a small group chose to return, but they, as well as Jews elsewhere, still lived under the rule of other nations. 500 years later, when Rome ruled Israel, two young Jews named Joseph and Mary, both descendants of the royal line of David, planned to marry. But before they came together, Mary became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, don't worry about taking Mary as your wife, for the child in her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The child is the Son of God. And when she gives birth to this son, you must name him Jesus, which means Savior, for he will save his people from their sins. This happened as the prophet Isaiah had foretold. The Lord himself shall give you a sign Behold, a virgin will bear a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Joseph and Mary had to travel to the city of Bethlehem for a census and to pay taxes. And while there, Mary gave birth to her firstborn son, whom they named Jesus. So, as prophesied, Jesus was born in Bethlehem to a descendant of King David. And in the same country there were shepherds watching over their flocks at night. 
And the angel of the Lord came to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were very frightened. Then the angel said, Don't be afraid, for I bring good news of great joy for all people. Today a Savior was born for you, which is Christ the Lord. And the child grew, becoming strong in spirit, and the grace of God was on him. Jesus matured, increasing in wisdom and in favor with God and man. Now when Jesus was about 30 years of age, a man named John the Baptist came preaching and baptizing in the wilderness, saying, Repent! Prepare yourselves for the Lord! John was the messenger the prophets had foretold would announce the coming of the Savior. Then Jesus came to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. And when John saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went straight up out of the water, and the heavens opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove and light on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then, after Jesus spent 40 days in the desert, Satan, who had successfully tempted Eve in the garden, tried ways of tempting Jesus. But Jesus would not sin. Finally, Satan took Jesus to an especially high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Then Satan said, All these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus answered, Get away from me, Satan, because God has written that you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. While Jesus, the Son of God, lived on earth in the form of a man, he was tempted in all the same ways we are, yet he never sinned. So where Adam failed, Jesus succeeded. This showed that Jesus indeed could be the Savior of mankind the Lamb sent from God. Jesus revealed himself as the promised Savior in many ways, including performing countless miracles. At a wedding feast, he changed water into wine. He healed a man who had been lame for 38 years. A man full of leprosy and untouchable saw Jesus and fell on his face, saying, Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. Jesus then reached out his hand and touched him, saying, Be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Jesus brought sight to a man who had been blind from birth. One woman, who for twelve years had a disease which doctors could not heal, reached out and touched Jesus' robe. He turned, saying, Daughter, be comforted. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Those suffering from different kinds of diseases were brought to him, and he healed them all. Jesus called twelve men together, asking them to follow him. He gave them power and authority over devils, and he sent these disciples out to preach about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. His fame went everywhere, and great crowds came together to hear him teach and to be healed of their diseases. When a gathering of five thousand people needed food, Jesus prayed over a young boy's lunch of bread and fish. The food was miraculously multiplied so that it fed the whole throng with twelve baskets left over. But the people kept asking for more proof that Jesus was from God. They said, Our forefathers ate manna in the desert. It's written in the scriptures. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus replied, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The people said, Lord, give us this bread all the time. And Jesus answered, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes on me shall never thirst. Jesus prophesied that he must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and then be raised from the dead on the third day. Most of the religious and political leaders rejected Jesus' teaching. However, one, 
a Pharisee named Nicodemus came to Jesus at night seeking truth. Jesus told him, Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus asked, Can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus explained, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You should not be so amazed that I said you must be born again. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus scolded him for teaching others about religion when he didn't understand spiritual truths himself. Then Jesus explained spiritual birth. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. He sent him so that the world might be saved. The real condemnation is this. Light came into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. He who believes on the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Finally, Nicodemus understood, and he believed. To a foreign woman, Jesus said, Whoever drinks the water that I give shall never thirst. It shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman said, I know that Messiah will come, who will be called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us everything. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am that Messiah. Later, Jesus taught the people, saying, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and follow me. For what does it benefit a person if he gains the wealth of the whole world and loses his own soul? Watch out. Beware of greed. For a person's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he owns. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting and said, What are we going to do? This man is performing so many miracles. Let him continue. Everyone will believe on him. And then the Romans will revoke our right to control the people. Meanwhile, Jesus taught with great authority. He went into the temple and threw out the merchants who were inside, buying and selling. He said to them, It is written in the scriptures, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he taught, saying, This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who believes on the Son may have everlasting life, and I will raise up from the grave those who believe. But there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that did not believe, and who would betray him. So there was a split among the people because of it. Among the chief rulers, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess their belief, since they were afraid they might be expelled from their religious meeting places. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Most of the religious leaders looked for a way to destroy Jesus, but could not find one, because all the people were anxious to hear him when he spoke. Jesus continued teaching in the temple, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And he said to those who believed on him, If you continue living as I tell you, then you are indeed my disciples. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I am the door. If any man comes to God through me, he shall be saved. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man snatch them out of my hand. After three years of teaching, Jesus instructed his disciples to bring him a certain young donkey 
one that had never been ridden, and he sat on it. Then as he rode toward Jerusalem, a huge crowd began to rejoice and loudly praise God for all the mighty works which they had seen. They called out, Hosanna! Blessed be the King that comes in the name of the Lord! Peace in heaven and glory in the highest! But when Jesus neared the city, he looked at it and cried over it, because the people still did not recognize him as the promised Savior. Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' twelve disciples. And Judas conspired with the chief priests and captains about how he might betray Jesus. They were glad and agreed to give him thirty pieces of silver to inform them of a time and a place they could capture Jesus when there were no crowds around him. Jesus knew that his hour to die had come, so he gathered his disciples together for a Passover dinner. As they ate, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say unto you, I will not any more drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it again with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus said, Don't let yourselves be upset. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again to get you so that you can be with me. And you know where I'm going, and you know the way to get there. But Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how could we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That evening, Jesus also warned the disciples of difficult times to come. He said, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me before it hated you. He that hates me hates my father also. After supper, Jesus walked to a garden called Gethsemane for a time of prayer. His disciples followed him to this secluded place. After his prayer, the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders arrived there looking for him. And Judas who had just eaten with Jesus, was leading the group. Judas approached Jesus, greeting him with a kiss of betrayal. Suddenly, when Jesus identified himself to the mob by saying, I am, the crowd went backwards and fell to the ground. After that, Jesus allowed himself to be tied up and brought into the high priest's house. The temple officers who held Jesus ridiculed him and spit in his face. And when they had blindfolded him, they punched him and slapped him on the face and said, Prophesy, you holy man, who hit you? Early the next morning, the crowd led Jesus to the Roman governor, Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow corrupting our Jewish nation. But after questioning Jesus, Pilate told the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, He has done nothing worthy of death. Now just order him to be beaten and then release him. But they called out all at once, saying, Get rid of this man! Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate, wanting to satisfy the people, had Jesus whipped and then turned him over to be crucified. The Roman soldiers braided a mock crown of thorns, placing it on his head. And they put a purple robe on him. They said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they beat him with their fists. Afterwards, they took Jesus and led him away, making him carry a wooden cross up to a place called Calvary, also known as Golgotha, or the place of a skull. There, in the same area, where many years before God had told Abraham to sacrifice his only beloved son Isaac, they nailed Jesus, God's only beloved son, to the cross. As they did this, Jesus said, Father, Forgive them, they don't know what they're doing.
While Jesus hung between two criminals who were also being executed, soldiers took his clothes, gambling for his robe, which fulfilled the prophetic words spoken by David. For three hours the people watched. The rulers with them mocked Jesus, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. Then a darkness came on the land and stayed for three more hours as the prophet's words were fulfilled. The Lord laid the sins of us all on him. Jesus then cried out with a loud voice saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, knowing that everything was now accomplished, fulfilled scripture when he said, I thirst. The soldiers ridiculed Jesus as they offered him vinegar by saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Jesus tasted the vinegar, then called out, It is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Then he bowed his head and let his spirit go. As he died, the sun darkened, and the earth quaked, and the thick veil of the temple ripped down the middle. When the Roman captain in charge saw what had happened, he said, Truly, truly this man was the Son of God. Then the soldiers came broke the legs of the two thieves who were hanging on the crosses beside Jesus. But when the soldiers saw that Jesus was already dead, they didn't break his legs. Instead, one of them pierced his side with a spear, allowing blood and water to pour out. All of this happened so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. None of his bones will be broken. And they shall look on him whom they pierced. Afterwards, two believers, Joseph and Nicodemus, took Jesus' body, wound it in linen grave clothes dipped in spices, and laid his body in a tomb. Then, as requested by the Jewish leaders, the tomb was sealed and guarded by Roman soldiers. Now, after three days, there was a great earthquake, and an angel of the Lord rolled back the stone from the tomb's door. In fright, the Roman soldiers trembled and then ran away. When followers of Jesus came to the tomb and saw the stone move, they were confused. Suddenly, two men stood by them in shining garments, saying, Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you before that he must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words. The same day in the evening, Jesus came to the disciples and stood among them and said, Peace to you. But they were terrified, thinking that they were seeing a spirit. So he said, Look at my hands and my feet. It's really me. Touch me and see, for a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. Everything happened as I told you it would, because all the writings that described me in the Law of Moses and in the Prophets and in the Psalms had to be fulfilled. Then he opened their understanding, saying, It is written in the Scriptures that Christ must suffer and rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be preached in his name among all nations. And you have seen these things. Jesus continued appearing to many people, showing them that he was alive, which gave infallible proof of his resurrection. And he instructed his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. At the end of 40 days, Jesus announced to his disciples, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall tell others about me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea 
and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. As they watched, Jesus was taken up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Two men in white clothing said, Why are you standing there staring up into heaven? This same Jesus who was just taken up into heaven shall come back again in the same manner as you saw him go. So the followers of Jesus went throughout the land preaching and baptizing and telling everyone that Christ the Savior was risen from the dead. They showed in the scriptures how by Adam came sin and death, but by Jesus Christ came forgiveness and the resurrection of the dead. They told how one day all the bodies of those who trusted God and believed in Jesus as their Lord and Savior would be raised from the dead and together with those who are alive will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. God's book also says that heaven will open and Jesus will return to earth as the conquering king and righteous judge. And the name written on his clothes will be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the armies which are in heaven will follow him upon white horses. Jesus will stand on the Mount of Olives just as the prophet Zechariah said, and the mountain will divide, and Christ will reign over all of the earth. But when a thousand years expire, Satan will once more go out to deceive the nations. But fire will come down from God and devour those who follow Satan. Then finally, Satan, the deceiver, will be thrown into the lake of fire and be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then in front of a great white throne, the dead, both small and great, will stand before God. And whoever is not found written in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. But in a new heaven and a new earth, God will be with his people. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And there shall be no night, and no need for candles, nor light from the sun, because the glory of God and the Lamb will be the light. And they shall reign forever and ever. And the tree of life will be there and the curse on mankind will be gone. Jesus says, let those who are thirsty come. Let them freely drink the water of life. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed are they who obey my words. He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not be condemned, but is passed from death unto life. This is God's story for you. You just saw that God, the creator and giver of life, has spoken, and he does care about you and you can know him and his wonderful plan for your life. But God is holy and must be approached on his terms. God wants you to worship him as the only God in your life. But just as Adam and Eve failed to trust God, so all of us have sinned by trying to run our own lives without God. The Bible says that even if you obey all of God's laws but one, you are a lawbreaker and a guilty sinner before him. So no matter how religious you might be or how many good deeds you may have done, you can never measure up to God's holiness. You are lost and separated from God. But you also saw that God understands your helplessness and He loves you so much that He arranged to have His Son take your punishment and die for your sins. The Bible says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation is a gift. It can't be worked for. So no one can boast about earning it. Just as Jesus told the religious leader, Nicodemus, that he must be born again to have eternal life, you too must be born spiritually into God's family. God is a spirit, and you cannot communicate with him until you take on a spiritual nature. 
That is why you need to invite Jesus to come into your life and to forgive you of your sin. If you want to become a child of God and have Jesus as your Savior, speak right now to God. You can pray these words quietly or out loud along with me. Dear God, I recognize my sin and rebellion against you. Thank you for allowing Jesus to take the punishment for my sin by dying on the cross. I would like Jesus to come into my life, to be my Savior and my Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer and you want to know more about God, there are three things you should do. You need to talk to God often in prayer. You need to listen to Him by reading His words, the Bible. And you need to find a church where people love God and His Word so you can get to know Him better.